All right. Uh, we're going to go to Dr. Andy Woods here in just one second uh, with a Middle East update. We're going to talk about a peace treaty. Are we headed for a peace treaty between the Palestinian Liberation Organization, the PLO, the uh, Islamist in Israel? Or what about the temple and the building of a third temple, Gog Magog, that war? Is that coalition being set up? Where are we at with that? Global rebellion, Mark of the Beast technology. Uh, where are we going with all of this? Let's get an understanding uh, from a Bible prophecy perspective, something that's continually to grow in popularity as more and more people are saying, wait a minute, as a kid, I remember hearing this in the Bible. Is that what's starting to unfold here? The stage is being set for those Bible events to come to pass. Dr. Andy Woods, he's a pastor. He's a lawyer, president of a seminary. Uh, he is an author also of many, many books on this topic. He'll join us for that update. Joining us now is Dr. Andy Woods. As I said, he's a pastor. He's a, an attorney. He's a seminary president. He's the author of numerous books, been to Israel many times. He's an expert on the Middle East and Israel and Bible prophecy, which is growing in popularity. He joins us now to give us an update on what's going on in the Middle East and with the stages being set for a coming peace treaty between the Palestinian Liberation or Organization, the Islamists, and the Jews, the Jewish state of Israel, as well as the desire for a third temple by the Jews. Could we see the third temple up there on the mount, the Temple Mount, alongside the Islamic mosque? What about the Mark of the Beast technology and so much more? How about the coalition of nations that the Bible says in Ezekiel 38 are preparing to move against Israel for her treasure. What could some of that treasure be? That book written there, Ezekiel 38, over 2,000 years ago, I, I don't know, what could the treasure be? They weren't even a nation for many years, and they became a nation right out of the, right out of the desert, 1948, May of 48, declared a nation. But what treasure would they have? Well, now we find out they have technology to pull water right out of the air for, ear, for making and growing crops. How about they have lots of natural gas, tons of it, maybe oil? How about gold and silver? What else do they have? Uh, lots of reasons to take over Israel for their treasure that the Bible says this coalition of nations will move against to grab said treasure. So much is happening because those nations now are in military and economic alliance, and they're right there on the border of Israel inside Syria. Russia, China, Iran, Turkey, they're right there. Joining us now is Dr. Andy Woods. Dr. Dr. Woods, welcome back to the broadcast. Thanks for joining us. Brandon, good to be here. Thanks for having me today. Great to have you with us as well. I'm going to go to a uh, PowerPoint presentation. We're going to roll through as much as we can tonight. I don't know we'll get to every bullet point, but here's a lot of them. Peace Treaty, Temple, uh, Gog Magog, a global religion, Mark of the Beast technology. Let's get to some of these. Peace treaty. Why is it important to watch for a peace treaty? And where are we at seeing maybe perhaps a peace treaty being confirmed? My friend, the late doctor, your friend as well, the late Dr. Jimmy DeYoung used to say he didn't believe there needed to be written a peace treaty. He believed there was plenty of the Oslo Accords and others, the Abraham Accords and others now. Uh, we could take all these treaties. We just need to put them into effect, confirm them. So maybe even a treaty doesn't need to be written so much as put into effect. Why is this important, and how close are we to this, these treaties? And do you think those treaties need to be written, or do you think they just need to be confirmed by a global leader known as the Antichrist? Well, I think that the peace treaty is needed because Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, uh, the first part of the verse, says the peace treaty between the Antichrist and unbelieving Israel is the event which will start the seven-year tribulation period. Now, when you think about this for a minute, um, in order for Israel to reach out to the Antichrist for a peace treaty, she, she must be in some kind of state of uh, vulnerability, you know, defenselessness, dependency. And that's the significance, I believe, of the so-called two-state solution, which is designed to take uh, what many flippantly refer to as the West Bank the biblical name for it is better uh, paraphrased or read as Judea and Samaria. Take that territory away from the Jewish people, which they won in a war of self-defense in 1967, and give that back to either the Palestinians or the international community. And when you just look at a map, you see how Israel's width is reduced to less than 10 miles should that happen. 
So that would place Israel in a place of vulnerability to reach out to the Antichrist to guarantee her survival. And that's why that first article I sent you, I found so interesting. It deals with Abbas, the leader of the Palestinians, going to China. And certainly in your Hold broadcast. it down, guys. Let me go to that. I'm going to go to that article so they can all see that. Okay, pick it up there, Dr. Woods. Yeah, going to China. Here it is. Certainly in your, your broadcast, you mentioned China over and over again, you know, the aggressive nature of China. Abbas going to China to get sort of counseling or um, help or advice, support to reinstitute this uh, two-state solution. And so what's happening is the nations of the earth are now pressuring Israel to give up Judea and Samaria uh, in exchange for the promise of peace. And I think that's going to put Israel in a place of almost defenselessness where the stage will then be set for her to reach out, you know, to the Antichrist to guarantee her survival. And that's what will launch the seven year tribulation period. So that's the significance of all of these things as I see it. All right, let's go to the next one. Uh, here's the next story. Whoop, let's see where it goes. Here we go. Here's the next one. Muslims again admit Jewish temples stood on the Temple Mount. This was come, come under the heading of the uh, need for a, a tribulation temple, the third temple. So why, why is this an important article out of uh, Israel today? Well, because it goes against the Islamic narrative that there never was this uh, temple, you know, the Solomonic temple who built Solomon, who built temple number one, you know, beneath the Dome of the Rock. And it's interesting that when you go into Islamic um, paraphernalia that they put together for tourists back in 1924, they basically admit that this is where the Solomonic temple stood. And they've since deleted all of those references, you know, from their material. But lo and behold, here comes this uh, book written by these two individuals, one of them a uh, Jordanian. Um, the title of the book is called The Noble Sanctuary, uh, basically a, a photo book. And here we go again, where they kind of accidentally admitted in this book that, oh, my gosh, uh, the Solomonic Temple... Um, is exactly where they said it was back in 1924. Now, the gentleman that put this book together, I think, was put under pressure by the Jordanian government to come back and sort of, you know, minimize the statement, marginalize the statement in the book. But the book says what it says. And so now we have even Islamic sources themselves that are acknowledging that the Solomonic Temple is beneath the Dome of the Rock. And as this uh, narrative is diffused, you know, the narrative being there never was a Solomonic Temple there to begin with, as that is being diffused, what's happening, I believe, is the world community is being sensitized to the fact that that Temple Mount area belongs to the Jews. And so let's let them go ahead and build the build Temple number three. And as they rebuild Temple number three, that shows us how close we're getting to the seven year tribulation period. Because according to Daniel chapter 9, verse 27, halfway into the seven-year tribulation period, the Antichrist will desecrate temple number three, something that can't happen unless the Jews very quickly start building temple number three. And we've so seen, by the way, and we've seen, by the way, that, that some of the rabbis over there, according to their code, are already cutting some of the rocks they say they're going to use in the temple. You can go online and find the video of them doing that. Uh, they've already got the uh, robes for the Levites made. They've got the instruments for sacrifice. They have uh, trained the Levites. They uh, have their harps and so much ready, the instruments needed for the practices and the ceremonies in the Third Temple. You can see them on display, I understand, at the uh, Temple Institute there in Jerusalem, in Israel. They uh, now have five red heifers that they've last year flew from Texas to Israel that if they buy, I think, what is it, this uh, <clears throat> less than a year now, less than a year now, if they stay without any blemishes, uh, they'll be at the right, correct age with no blemish in less than a year. If they can stay that way, no blemishes, they will be at the age where they can be sacrificed, their ashes burnt and their ashes mixed with water for purification of the temple, correct? Yeah, the red heifer is necessary to dedicate the temple. 
And the fact that they're breeding the red heifer aggressively as I speak, you just gave the facts on it, shows you how close at least they think they are to rebuilding temple number three. And now even Islamic sources themselves recognize that where the Dome of the Rock area is, is where temple number, uh, temple number one once stood. And so let me just kind of summarize it by saying this. Um, when you look at a stopwatch, and I've heard many prophecy teachers use this analogy, you look at a stopwatch, and when you're dealing, when the discussion of the world moves to Israel, you're dealing with God's hour hand. When the discussion of the world leaves Israel and moves to the city of Jerusalem, now we're dealing with the minute hand. And when the discussion of the world leaves Israel and leaves Jerusalem and focuses on the Temple Mount, which is what all of these stories that I've referenced and you referenced earlier are referring to, we're now dealing with the second hand. And it shows us how fast the tribulation period is approaching. That's the significance of these things. Mm, absolutely. And if they want to understand the uh, ceremonies and how they have to be done according to the red heifer in the temple, they'll find a lot of that, I think, in Numbers chapter 14, correct? Uh, very good. Uh, I would just uh, correct you on that. It's Numbers 19. 19, but, sorry. But you're in the right book. <laughs> we're in the right book. That's good. And you're in the teens in terms of the chapter. All right, so we're close. We're a little off, close. but it, it's still <laughs> still not accurate. Numbers yeah. chapter 19. So folks who want to go read what that all looks like, there you go. But those five heifers are there in Israel on the ground now, having come from America, having come from breeders in Texas who are eager to help them with that. So all eyes there are watching to see if those uh, animals can stay pure and meet the qualifications, and which could be in less than a year, correct? Yeah, if, if all works out, people are saying six months to a year. Wow. And that's their, that's their figure, not mine. Yeah. I've been listening very carefully to what the Temple Institute has been saying. And so, you know, five years ago, ten years ago, um, to run into stories like this, they were very few and far between. Oh, absolutely. Let's put it that way. And today, it's almost every article that comes off the press, particularly related to the Middle East, is not dealing with Jerusalem anymore. It's not dealing with Israel in general. It's dealing with the temple. And that's Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. Let's go to uh, this article here at Times of Israel. Here it is. Deputy foreign ministers of Russia, Syria, Iran, Turkey to hold summit. Now, if you were moving to the next point, which we are, and we've gone from talking about the temple, we've gone from that to talking about a peace treaty, peace treaty, then temple. Now we're into Gog, Magog. This, this, these are some of those nations, Russia, Syria, Iran, Turkey, which are all right there in Syria, and now they're holding a big summit. I mean, what, how many years ago was it you could have talked about this and there was no military economic relationship between these nations? How many years ago? Oh, gosh, I would say maybe it's 5, 10, 15 years ago. I mean, there was So some if you were talking about this 15 years ago, there wasn't much of, there was really not much to say about a military economic connection or, or coalition between Russia, Syria, Iran, and Turkey. Certainly 20 years ago, there wasn't, right? Yeah, we wouldn't have much to talk about. We, we would have less to talk about than we're talking about right now. And today, now. every time we turn around, we're finding Russia, Syria, Iran, and Turkey are doing something, not to mention they're right there on the edge of Israel inside Syria, uh, of course, we know Israel's been attacking Iran inside Syria. Uh, so, again, this coalition uh, that the Bible speaks of in Ezekiel 38, which I understand Benjamin Netanyahu and many Jews study and understand, I mean, it's, it's on. It is a real deal right now. Yeah, if there's a part of the Bible that's in play, I would call it in play, it's Ezekiel 38 and 39, or Ezekiel 2,600 years ago, probably not even understanding his own prophecies uh, very well, like we can understand them today, saw Russia, um, which is Rosh, Persia, which is Iran, and Turkey. Um, Turkey would be uh, Togarma and um, uh, Meshach, Tubal, and, and one other about, about four names there in Ezekiel 38 are given over to Turkey. I have a book, by the way, called The Middle East Meltdown, where people can doc, you can see how I document all of this. But it describes what I would call the big three, Russia, Iran, and Turkey, invading the land of Israel in the last days to capture Israel's wealth. 
So for those prophecies to be fulfilled, and when you study all of Ezekiel's past prophecies historically, they all came to pass with uncanny accuracy. Um, and so we know that this prophecy is eventually going to come to pass, I think, sooner rather than later. But when you uh, look at that prophecy very clearly, you have to have an Israel in the land. Uh, check. We've got that. You've got to have an Israel becoming wealthy. Check. We've got that with potential gold discoveries, oil discoveries, uh, mineral deposits in the, um, the Dead Sea. You've got discoveries of oil off Israel's northern coastline. So check, Israel is becoming wealthy. You have to have Russia, Iran, and Turkey posturing against Israel. And keep in mind that back in the 1970s, Turkey and Iran were allies of Israel, not enemies of Israel. Russia, uh, prior to the communist revolution in 1917, was a Christian Orthodox country. So all of those countries must turn against Israel. Check, we've got that. And then if that weren't enough, you've got to have all three of them in terms of stage setting, cooperating with each other. Check, that's what that uh, article that you just referenced refers to. They're having a big meeting in, um, I think it's Kazakhstan, if I remember right. And also you have to have them perched on Israel's northern border check we've got that because all of them uh, of recent times have a presence in Syria which is directly uh, to the north of the nation of Israel so I don't know how much clearer this can happen before Ezekiel's prophecy is fulfilled but the clarity is coming together in in great precision indeed it is let's look at this uh, a graphic here on the map because it shows the Gog Magog scenario there's Israel in the middle we have Russia, or Rosh, as the Bible refers to it. Go to the table of nations. You can quickly figure out what nations are being talked about, Ezekiel 38. So we got Russia. We've got Turkey, Iran, Sudan, Libya. Then we have the uh, Central Asia, the Stan nations, if you will, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, etc. So they're all around Israel. Look at that little red sliver, and they're going after that nation. They have so much, and yet they want Israel uh, clearly shows us it's of a demonic nature, is it not? Well, it clearly is because Ezekiel 38 talks about thoughts will enter your mind of, of these invading nations. Now, who who puts evil thoughts into the minds of men? Well, clearly that's Satan. You remember David uh, was going to number the troops. I think that's over in First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1. And it tells us very clearly there that it was Satan that put that idea into David's mind. And so the thing you have to understand about Satan is he hates the nation of Israel because he knows that the kingdom is going to come to the earth through the nation of Israel. He doesn't want that to happen because during that kingdom age, we call it the millennium, he will lose authority over the earth. He'll be bound in a place called the abyss for a thousand years. And at the conclusion of the kingdom age, he'll be thrown into the lake of fire. You'll see that in Revelation chapter 20, verses 2 and 3 and verse 10. <clears throat> so in Satan's darkened mind, he thinks he can actually stop these kingdom promises from materializing. And what better way to do it than try to snuff out the instrument through which the kingdom will come, which is the nation of Israel. And that's why these uh, demonic thoughts enter the mind of these attackers. So when you ask me, is it demonic or satanic at its core, uh, the, the answer to that is a resounding, resounding yes. In our remaining moments, let's talk quickly about Mark of the Beast technology. That's in our little presentation tonight. Here we go. Check a look, check, take a look at this from the insider Hundreds of Protestants attended a sermon in Nuremberg given by ChatGPT, which told them not to fear death. Uh, I did a story on this last week. It apparently was not very, very inspirational. Some of the people didn't really care for it. It was not all that good, but it did take place. Um, so, again, I, I bring that up because I think this kind of technology will be in the last days. Here we go. Slay News. World Economic Forum calls for AI to rewrite the Bible, create religions that are actually correct. You know, these are two very evil guys, uh, obviously, Yuval, uh, Yuval Noah Harari and Klaus Schwab. Uh, I mean, talk about characters for the Antichrist or counselors. These could apply, I, I believe. So AI, 
what role will it play in the um, uh, mark of the beast technology? Well, here's the Institute writing, the new immigration bill is a Trojan horse for E-Verify and is a threat to all Americans. So there you go. Uh, all of this. How is AI technology, E-Verify, mark of the beast technology coming about? Let's start with AI technology. Well, Revelation 13, verse 15, John 2,000 years ago saw a talking statue. Um, and when you study that passage, you'll see in Greek the word proskuneo, which means worship. It's basically encouraging uh, the masses to worship the Antichrist, this talking statue. Now, John, obviously, 2,000 years ago, doesn't use the expression artificial intelligence. He didn't know what it was. But to me, when I see a, uh, a statue AI type entity leading a worship service, um, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, that's a potential scenario uh, whereby Revelation chapter 13, verse 15 um, could be fulfilled. Now, the article that you mentioned, it's very interesting. It does say the older people in that packed worship service didn't like it. But the article goes on and says the younger people, uh, talks about a Lutheran, a very young Lutheran pastor, I think about 30 years of age, who brought all his youth. They just loved it. And uh, that's the, that, this, that, that younger generation could be the generation that sees all of these things.